to Mark chapter 2, if you will, in our study of the book of Mark, as we're reading what God is wanting to accomplish through the Messiah, Jesus, Mark is telling us how swiftly, how forcefully, and how quickly Jesus begins his ministry. We saw that last week, the forceful take it by force, the kingdom is being brought into the to the earth with power and might from the time of John the Baptist through Jesus, that moment in which he is now bringing uh, the ministry of the kingdom of God to set free those who are captive, to give sight to the blind and healing to the sick. Last week we saw that Jesus healed the lame and, the, and those who were sick and afflicted and cast out demons and cleansed the lepers. And so we see the kingdom of God powerfully coming in on the earth. And now, as we look at the Gospel of Mark, Mark wants to introduce another point concerning the ministry of Jesus. And if you will, we start at Mark Mark chapter 2, verse 23, and he says this, on uh, one Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, Why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to those Pharisees, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar the high priest, and he ate the bread, the showbread of the presence, which which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him? And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, you need to have an understanding of what the Sabbath is to Israel to begin to consider the weight of what Jesus just said and what he did. Jesus deliberately would heal people on the Sabbath. He would deliberately go and put in the face of these Pharisees and Sadducees the work of the Lord on the Sabbath. And it really riled them up. Because you have to understand what's at stake here and what the concern is. Let's first of all begin with understanding what the Sabbath is. We know that it was introduced to Israel by Moses, but that's not the first we heard of a Sabbath. In fact, we know that the Sabbath even came before the law. It's a creation mandate. It came at the creation of man and woman in Adam and Eve. And on the seventh day, after God had done all his work and labor in creation, he rested. What's important to understand in the sense of the Middle Eastern sense of rest and Sabbath is not just to stop work, but in fact to reign. To rest when a king rests It means that he is in his session, in authority over his kingdom. He's seated upon his throne, and all labor to produce the kingdom is done, and now he rules over it. So on the seventh day when God rested, he wasn't tired. Why would God have to take a break? And so we would apply that sense of, that's a lot of work making fish and animals and birds and trees. I'm tired. I need a break. That's not God. What he's saying by saying he rested is he separated that day and exalted it so that all of creation could now respond to the majesty of the one who made it. You're functioning. You're working. The wind is blowing. The trees are growing. The Cows are mooing, the cattle is woeing, the birdies are chirping, and man is singing. So everyone, set your gaze for a day, and in the timetable that I've established, and see my authority rule and reign. The Sabbath is glorious. It is a day that we have forsaken. And I'm not getting into the sabbatical law of Saturday and so forth, but what I'm saying is setting time to gaze upon the glory of Christ. It should happen Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday because He, Christ, is our Sabbath rest. That's what Christ is going to declare and show them. 
But the Sabbath was very, very important. Now, to Israel, it became even more important because what God did with it is he declared it as the covenant sign. I'll read to you Exodus 31, verse 13. In Exodus 31, 13, God said this, You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. Above all what? Above all. Above all the law and all that I have made as covenant with you, above everything else, you shall keep my Sabbaths. That's above all. That's principle. If you're going to keep a law, folks, this is the one. In other words, honor me. Above everything else, honor me. Sit with me. Be with me. Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. And here it is. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. That means set you apart. It's the Lord that sets you apart as a nation. It is I who sets you apart. You'll remember me and all that I have done to make you a great nation, to make you a light among a dark world, to set you as a city on a hill. You'll stop everything you're doing, all your labor, and remember it's me who gives you seed in the field and harvests and agriculture and crops and peace. I am your military might. I'm your shield. I'm your protector. You'll stop all work and remember that once a week. Every seven years, your field will rest so that you consecrate the land back to me, so that we set Christ in the center of everything. We've set us in the center of everything, brothers and sisters. Life is about me. In my world, how about yours? It's about you and yours, but it shouldn't be. Life is about Him in all of our lives. That's where our unity comes from. That's where our togetherness comes from. This world isn't about me and it's not about you. And if you think it is, you're in trouble. But he wants to set apart in all of our lives one God, one rule, one authority. You rest on this fact that I am God and there is no other. And he said, this shall be a sign between you and me. In fact, Ezekiel backs that up in chapter 20 and he says, Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them, or again, sets them apart. Now, in the Eastern culture, whenever a covenant is made, there are three parts to a covenant. One, the promise spoken or the word given. Secondly, a sign, a symbol that represents your in covenant. And thirdly, the cutting of covenant. There must be blood. Because any covenant that you enter into, you must die to the old life to merge together in covenant to have a new life. And the cutting of covenant, the cutting of blood, represented the death of your old identity because you have now come into a new identity in covenant. Those three symbols are important for covenant. And so what God said, look at how many of you remember the story of Noah? Okay, Noah built an ark. And he was, if you will, another Adam. He he continued the human race on because all of mankind was put to death. And so God made a covenant with Noah and he made a promise. This is his promise. I will never flood or destroy the earth by water again. That was the covenant word, wasn't it? That was the promise. Does anybody remember the covenant sign? The rainbow shall be cast in the sky, right? There's a whole new system to planet Earth since it shifted. And now you'll see that there's a new type of atmosphere around the Earth where rain falls, sun goes through it and creates rainbow. God's not going to destroy the Earth anymore. He shifted the very axis of it and changed the the atmosphere and dynamic of planet Earth. So he promised, I'm not going to, that's my sign to you. I won't destroy it. Now, he is going to destroy it by fire. Those are his options. He can do these things. It's just not with water, right? And then what did Noah do? Noah took the extra animals that he had brought that were clean and he sacrificed them, offering them to God so that he would enter covenant with God. How many of you remember Abraham? God made a covenant with Abraham. I will make your seed as many as the stars of the sky and the sand of the, of the shore. I will make your name great. I will bless you and bless all those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And so those are the words of his covenant. Then he had a sign of that covenant. Does anybody remember the covenant sign of Abraham? Circumcision, circumcision. And there was blood there with that too. 
There's the cutting right involved in that act. And so there's a covenant word, a covenant sign, and the cutting of blood. Well, now he comes to Israel and he says this, Israel, I will be your God and you will be my people. And there's the covenant promise. And what was the sign he gave to them that they were in covenant? That's right, I just laid it all out for you. Sabbath, it shall be a sign between you and I. And then, remember, they offered all the sacrifices. Moses sprinkled the blood on the people. And, and so they entered into covenant with God. And they are still in covenant with God. And God said that this Sabbath is my wedding ring to you. How many of you uh, have been married, ever been married? You said your vows, your covenant promises, and then the preacher said, is there a gift or a token by which we can seal this covenant vow, the sign of covenant? There it is. The sign of covenant. All right? I won't get into the cutting of covenant. That was for the honeymoon night. But anyways, this is the sign of marriage covenant. Now, I want to ask you something. So if that's the sign, how important is it to Israel that they would keep their wedding ring? How important is it to you in your marriage that if you look at your mate and you say, wait wait a minute, minute, where's your wedding ring? I don't want to wear it anymore. I don't like it. (laughs) All right, this wedding ring is important. So now when you consider how important Sabbath is, it is in fact the covenant or the wedding ring between God and Israel. So we have that incident where a man is picking up wood on the Sabbath day. How many of you remember this? The people report it to Moses. Moses brings him before the, the, the group of elders, uh, and they say, what must we do with this man? And they determine to stone him and put him to death. It's a capital offense. Why? Because God, and this is where unbelievers don't get it. People read the word and they go, God is so mean. The dude's just picking up wood. What's his deal? It's not about the wood. It's not about what he was doing by laboring. It was about what he was saying against God. He might as well have taken off his wedding ring and spat upon it. Because it says that he shall not labor because that is your sacred vow and symbol to God. Let me put it to you this way. How many of you have a wedding ring on right now? All right, put your hands down. Good, thank you. Whose ring is that? It's not yours. That ring was given to you by your mate. You see, the important thing about the wedding ring is this. This isn't my wedding ring. This is my wife's wedding ring on me. These are are her vows to me. When she put this ring on my finger, she said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you in sickness and in health through richer or for poorer. And this is my covenant sign to you. And she holds the ring that I gave to her to promise her. I carry her promises with me. This isn't just about my fidelity. This is the promises of her to me. And so the Sabbath is God's promise to his people. If you'll honor the Sabbath, you're you're honoring my devotion to you. So for you to do something so mundane, to pick up wood, to start a fire for your comfort, uh, obliterating and acting against my whole heart and effort towards you, God said, is a shame. By the way, the only fire that's allowed on Sabbath is the fire on the altar of the temple. And so if you're to burn a fire on the temple, uh, I'm sorry, on Sabbath, you are kindling a fire that is separate from God. That's why that man was offending. And so this is huge. This is so important. Sabbath is everything. Now how many of you remember that Israel had an issue keeping Sabbath? They kept committing adultery against God whoring after other idols, other gods, and other activities, never keeping Sabbath. Not only were they to keep the Sabbath on the seventh day of the week, but every seven years they were to keep a Sabbath of the land because they're to always remember that land is God's land given to them. And every seven years to keep rest, they're supposed to not plant on that seventh year. God would give the increase on the sixth year. You had to have faith. You had to trust God. 
So every seven years, they're supposed to give the fields rest. Did they? Never once. Never once. For 490 years, Israel did not keep a Sabbath rest for the land. So you do the math. Every seven years, for 490 years, they did not keep Sabbath. How many times does seven go into 490? How many? Louder. 70 years. How many years did they spend in Babylon? God said, I'm going to get my rest for this land whether you like it or not. My word shall prevail and I will keep it. Whether you're going to steward it or not, you're going to go to a timeout. Get out of this land and you're going to be put in Babylon for 70 years because my land for 490 years, every seven years, should have had a rest. You didn't keep it. That 70 years. Get out. 70 years, Israel was land was put at rest. They were rebellious. So all of this is in their history. Now they're set free. They go back to rebuild the temple. They go back to Israel. They go back to Jerusalem. And so how concerned are they about keeping the law now? He means business. So they get very concerned. Let's keep Sabbath. Let's keep Sabbath. We better keep Sabbath. So what they decide to do is so that we don't make any other more problems... Let's put a hedge of protection around how we keep the law. And so they began to add to the law uh, uh, helps and more restrictions as to what Sabbath meant so that they wouldn't break it. Almost like what Adam did. How many of you remember this? When Adam told Eve, stay away from that fruit, right? Don't even touch it. Now, God didn't command them they couldn't touch it. God said, you can't eat it. And we know this because when the serpent said, what do you mean you can't, can you have any of the fruit? Eve said, we can't even go near it and we can't even touch it. She added to the command of God. Israel added to the commands of God and said, look it, we're not to do any labor on the Sabbath. What is labor? Mm, We better figure this out. Let's get technical. Let's get a Jewish lawyer here and just just rightly divide what is labor on a Sabbath. Hundreds of years they spent figuring out what is legal on Sabbath because we don't want to break it again, right? And in their zeal to do right by God, they failed God. Let me read to you from Alfred Edersheim. If you are looking for a good read, I would encourage you to read Alfred Edersheim, who was a strong believer, a Messianic Jewish man uh, from early uh, in the 1800s. And uh, He's written a number of excellent books on rabbinic thought and Jewish history. And he says this, he he writes some of the rabbinical ideas from the Mishnah as to what labor is. Uh, Some things that are considered considered a burden that uh, you shouldn't carry that would cause labor for you on the Sabbath. And and the rabbis came up with this, uh, you shouldn't carry pieces of paper, horses' hairs, wax, a piece of broken earthenware, or animal food. Don't feed your animal. You should have that prepared. Anything as heavy as a dried fig. That's a problem. Or a quantity sufficient to be of any practical use. It prescribed what might or might not be saved if one's house caught on fire. Oh, we're going to consider all things. So if your house catches on fire on the Sabbath, what can you legally and rightfully carry out of the burning house? Nothing heavier than a fig, right? Uh, Well, only those clothes that are absolutely necessary could be saved. But one could put on a dress, save it, then go back and put another one on. We've got ways to handle this. One could eat food on the Sabbath lawfully only if it had been specifically prepared for the Sabbath on a weekday. But you could not heat it by a fire because there can be no fires on Sabbath. If a laying hen laid an egg on the Sabbath, it could not be eaten. That's labor. But if the hen had been kept for fattening and not laying eggs, the egg could then be eaten since it would be considered a part of the hen that fell off. Laws regarding harvesting and healing on the Sabbath. 
Remember, Jesus' disciples were walking through a field of wheat, and as they're walking through a field of wheat, and you just happen to walk, and it's as high as you are, you just kind of run your hands through it. Anybody ever done that? And, and, and yeah, every now and then, you just kind of grab the, the, the fruit or the corn of the, of the wheat, and you just grab the top of it, and you can start peeling the little kernels, and they start eating it. Now, what does the Mishnah rabbinic teaching say about it? Even the slightest activity involving picking grain, removing husks, rubbing the heads, cleaning or bruising the ears, or throwing them up in the hand is forbidden. Yet if a man wanted to move a sheaf in his field on the Sabbath, he just needed to lay a spoon on it, and then if he wanted to move the spoon, he'd just pick up the whole sheaf and move the spoon. You can see how ridiculous it got these regulations were considered studying the Mishnah on the Sabbath more important than studying the Word of God. You see, well intentions went wrong, didn't they? How many of us have done the same thing? We have well intentioned plans, but the law kills. The letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. We, we wanted to do right. We, we wanted to live a righteous life. And, and so we set rules and regulations over our life to honor God. But what we've done, instead of relationship, we've developed religion. There's no life in it. Come on, how many of you have done this? How many of you men, in wanting to honor your wife and honor your family and do the best for them, you do hard and you work hard at your job and you work more hours at your job so that you can bless your family with more things? Your intention is right and you want to do the right thing for them, but the next thing you know, they don't see you because you're working overtime so much. But you mean to do well. You wanted to do right, but your kids didn't know you growing up because you worked 24-7. Huh? We have these kind of intentions. We can get mad at them. We can get mad at Israel. But they wanted to so guard themselves against failing God that they failed God. Ladies, have you ever had people coming over maybe for Thanksgiving or Christmas? You wanted it to be such a great family time and you did everything you could to make it just right and get everything in its right place? Huh? How many of you remember Mary and Martha? And you did everything to cook right and get everything set and all the decorations and all the house and all this and all that. And you're so caught up in in making everything right for them that when they get there, you're miserable. You can't wait for them to leave. You wanted to do right, but you did the opposite. How many of you remember Peter? Wanted to do right. At the Last Supper, he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And in his devotion to Christ, he did everything he could to stay close to him. He said, I have to prove it that I won't leave him. So I'm going to draw, draw closer. And someone said, hey, aren't you one of his? No, 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 I don't know him. Oh, he moved to the next place. I got to get closer. Hey, aren't you one of him? No, 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 no. In his heart, he wanted to do what was right. But all the time he wanted to do what was right, he was denying him. You see, so Jesus confronts them and says, you don't understand Sabbath. None of these laws is what God intended. And so when he says this, he said, you're killing the love for God and making it a law. You see, they, they added to the word of God. What they didn't realize is as they were trying to be honoring to God by obeying the law, they broke it by adding to the law. It says in Deuteronomy, you shall not add to the word of God which I have commanded you. Deuteronomy 4.2 Nor take anything from it. You You may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I commanded you. God never commanded them that they couldn't have a piece of wheat. That they couldn't do this and they couldn't do that. That was the scribe in the rabbinical teachings. They added to the law their measures. In fact, Jesus said this when confronting them about Sabbath. Matthew 23, 4. By adding the weight of their tradition to the law of God, they bound heavy burdens, hard to bear, and laid them on men's shoulders. You don't even understand Sabbath. You've strayed so far and made it such a religious exercise. I've got to ask ourselves, Christians, do we even understand salvation? We've made salvation our efforts and our works to be good people. What's happened? 
to the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. We call it the finished work of Christ. Why do we call it the finished work? Because it was done at the cross. You can't add anything to it. You can't make God love you more. He demonstrated how much he loved you while you were yet a sinner. We have this mentality that that if I do this right and I do that right, Jesus will love me more. And if I don't do it right, he doesn't love me enough. What you have just done is blaspheme the work of Christ on the cross. I'll back off from the word blaspheme because some of you will get nervous and think you've lost your salvation. I'm not talking about that. But if you think you can add to what Christ did, we're missing the love of God demonstrated for us by thinking we add something to it. No. No, you can't add to the law of God. Let's not put burdens on people. You remember the the Jerusalem council? Should they get circumcised to be a believer? Should they obey the law? And they said, look, we couldn't keep that burden. This grace, this accomplishment of Christ was one for all, one sacrifice for all time. We're saved by the merits of Christ, not by what we do. Does that give me the liberty to keep sinning? Absolutely not. Because you won't want to sin if you are a new creation in God. He took you out of a sinful nature and put you in Christ. So I got a problem with the Christians who say, I have liberty to sin, liberty to move towards my flesh. What is that thinking? That's not a converted mind. You have a new nature which is after Christ. Everything in me cries holy. And so what do I want to entertain my flesh for? No, 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 no. They lost it. They forgot about it. In fact, Jesus goes on and he says this, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. This was my gift to you. This is my wedding ring to you. This is my love bestowed on you. Could you just think about that? Could you go to a dance with me on Saturday night? Sabbath. Get it? Go for a walk with me. Talk with me. Sing to me. It's me and you. This is my gift to you for you to know me and enjoy me and learn my voice and understand me. But you've turned it into a a routine of some kind. You're missing it. Man wasn't made to do this and not do that. The Sabbath was made for us. It's ours. Look what you've done with it. He goes on in Mark 3. Let's move on in the Gospel of Mark to chapter 3 and look at verse 1. Again, he entered the synagogue and a man was there with a withered hand and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath. What's their concern? What's he going to do on the Sabbath? See how holy they are? Oh, how holy they are. They're so holy that they're missing the presence of God right in front of their face. They're ready to judge whether God in the flesh is going to do what they say they understand the word to mean. You know, brothers and sisters, may I give a warning to us as a people. We judge and determine other people's responses to the Lord, and we say, well, that's God. No, that's not God. Well, that must be flesh, or that's this and that. If I were you, I'd be a little more careful on how you assess people's response to God and what God is doing. Sometimes God does crazy things. We've got so much judgment in the church, one against the other. Such divisions. It sounds very pharisaical, wouldn't you say? That doesn't measure up with how I've measured God. Well, your yardstick is a bit short. I'm not saying we allow for the foolish and preponderous, goofy things, but every now and then, you might want to back off from your opinions and back off from your judgments and let God be God in somebody's life. Now he goes, they want to see, all right, let's sit back. Now, now here's the thing. The man's going to heal a man with a withered hand, and they're not even concerned about that. Wow, are they missing it. And he goes on, he says, so that they might accuse him. They're wanting to do one thing, judge him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, and I love this, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? What's Jesus doing? 
setting them up. Oh, he knows what he's doing. He knew what they were thinking. Come on, I, I wish I was, I am one of his disciples. But I, was just, I wish I was there to see this stuff. What's he doing? He, he stopped at the synagogue service. What's he doing? He's getting up again. Oh, boy, when Jesus stands up in synagogue, stuff happens. What's he going to do? Hey, he's calling Joe, Joseph. Isn't that the guy with the withered hand? Yeah, what's it, oh, what's he going to do? Hey, everybody pay attention. Let's see if he breaks the law. So then he turns to the Pharisees, of course, who have the prominent seats. He says, is it lawful to heal? Is it lawful to give life? Is it right to do this? And they were silent. You see, this is rabbinic. Uh, this is the understanding of how rabbis communicate to each other. They ask questions and expect a question back to get to the deeper understanding. They couldn't even answer him back. Do you remember he ran into that when he was 12 years old? <laughs> now that he's 30, he asks them profound questions that absolutely befuddle them. You answer. I'm not answering. I don't know what to... Would you say it? I don't know. Is it right? This is a setup. What are we going to do? And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. Now, we always see pictures of Jesus, you know, the 60s hippie Jesus with the suntan walking and so mystical and so wonderful. How come nobody paints a picture of him just angry? Anger and upset. What's he angry at? Listen, wasn't Israel, weren't the Pharisees trying to keep the law, not wanting to break it? They were sincere and not wanting to break it. I remember how Jesus, it says in Luke, when he heard the cock crow, it says that Peter was so close to him, he simply turned his head and their eyes met. Well, he was well-intentioned, but even in his well-intention, he failed Christ. How many of us in our well-intention of our religious pursuits have failed the ministry of God's Spirit in our lives? He looked at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. An instantaneous miracle that this withered and, and hand that was shriveled simply, he said, extended. And when he extended it, crackle, crackle, crunch, it was whole. That's the grace of God. And he did that healing for one thing to amaze the Pharisees. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him. How can we kill? this man. The Sabbath was made for man, not man, for the Sabbath. This is my wedding ring to you, Israel. All of my promises are held in that Sabbath sign. Is it right to heal on the Sabbath? Absolutely. Does God love on the Sabbath? Absolutely. Is it part of his covenant promises to Israel? Absolutely. You're missing it by a mile, he's telling them. The Sabbath is for you. Every promise I've ever made is found in that Sabbath. And if you'll do a study of Hebrews chapter 4, and if you completely understand the new covenant, Christ is our Sabbath. Every promise that God gave and made to Israel is found in the wedding ring promise, the one given to mankind. It's a creation ordinance. There is rest for the people of God. It is found not on Saturday. It's found today, every day. It's found in Christ. He's our rest. He's our fulfillment. He's our promises. He's our all in all. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you Sabbath. Rest. Is it right to heal on Sabbath? <laughs> what a question. course it is. And by the way, 
Jesus said, I never spoke my own words, nor did I do any of my own actions or works. I only do what I see the Father doing. So could I ask you, who healed the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath? God. Father's at work ruling and reigning. Sabbath is for us. Don't leave it behind. Don't make it some obligation where you read a commentary and a little devotion and think you've accomplished Sabbath rest. Last of all, we can't go past this, is the ultimate statement he made when he said this. (laughs) Chapter 2 of Mark 28, he said, in conclusion, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did I hear what he just said? Did I hear him right? Did Yeshua just say that he is the Lord of the Sabbath? Is, is this what I'm hearing? Peter, did, did you hear what our rabbi just said? Did he just say he's the Lord? He, he is the Lord? He is the ruler and master of Sabbath rest? He... Wait a minute, wait a minute. i got to think about this for a minute. Now, who instituted the Sabbath? God, where and when? In the beginning, God sanctified the seventh day and made it holy. If you call yourself Lord or ruler or master of the Sabbath, that it is yours to keep and to tend and to do what you will, you are therefore saying you are... God. He's the one who ordained the Sabbath. This is the love of God. Now, what he is actually demonstrating and displaying for all of us so that we would understand Sabbath is watch what Jesus does. Now you will understand resting in God. You heal, you deliver, you love, you minister. You give. This is the gift of Sabbath to man. It's all of God's promises as a sign that they are yours. We we argue over keeping Saturday or Sunday, and we miss it. We argue if we should turn the TV on or allow a sport event or not. I understand the devotion to it. But we become like Pharisees to determine how long, what time, what should we do, what can't we do when we're not even spending the time with God. Well, it's okay because I watch Christian movies and Christian TV on Sabbath. Good for you. But have you spent five minutes in the presence of your love? And Jesus demonstrated Sabbath by saying, I'm the master of the Sabbath. I am Lord over the Sabbath. And what I am showing you, whether we had some wheat to eat, David got it, David understood it. Life is in the Sabbath. Fellowship is in the Sabbath. I am the Sabbath. I am your rest. I am your everything. You're all in all. Let us bow our heads.